Welcome to Curbside Consults, a podcast series where we take a deep dive into key clinical topics and articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine with expert clinicians and educators. I'm Amanda Fernandez, one of this year's editorial fellows at the NEJM. There are over 10 million people in the U.S. that have osteoporosis. Worldwide, osteoporosis is estimated to affect 200 million people. So osteoporosis is common, and so are fractures. There's been a lot in the news recently regarding bone health with vitamin D, and recently the FDA approved a new drug to treat osteoporosis. Given all of this, we thought it would be great to cover osteoporosis. So on this episode, we're going to go over screening and management. Joining us on today's episode, we are very excited to have Dr. Clifford Rosen, Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine, Director of Clinical and Translational Research, and a Senior Scientist in Maine Medical Center's Research Institute, and Associate Editor for the New England Journal of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Amanda. Nice to be here. We're excited to have you. So to start off our discussion, I'm going to go into a case, and then we'll use that to kind of uh, discuss our main topics for today. So let's meet Mrs. Evans. She is a 69-year-old Caucasian woman with a history of an ankle fracture about five years ago. She's otherwise asymptomatic, and she's coming in to see you for a routine evaluation. So Dr. Rosen, should she be screened for osteoporosis? So she's 69. She's postmenopausal. So uh, virtually all the guidelines are universal in suggesting people over 65 be screened, particularly women over 65. So yes, she should be screened. One clue that she might have something going on is the ankle fracture five years ago. Okay. Now, I know there are a lot of different guidelines, and you mentioned that most of them will recommend some of the same things, and some of them vary in the finer details. Is there one that you prefer to use? No, I think the U.S. Public Service Task Force um, is actually some of the most conservative recommendations, but the ones that I use, and they've been right on for as long as uh, they've been issuing recommendations. I think early on, we were screening women in their 50s, and I think that has now been revised, and USPSTF has been one of the uh, general guideline groups that have been consistent at age 65 and over. So Okay. So just in general, a woman who's postmenopausal and 65, you want to screen. What about for men? So that's a difficult question. They often come in with their wives, so sometimes they ask for bone density screening. But generally, recommendations are 70 and over unless there's a concurrent disease or morbidity associated with drugs such as glucocorticoids. So I generally wait. Wait, okay. And then what about if you have a woman who's not postmenopausal? So say Mrs. Evans was now 55, and she's coming in saying, I've heard people getting this scan. Should I get one as well? What would you tell her? So I would say that we could do the scan, whether it would be actionable, that we would do something about it, depending on the results. I would say that leaves us in another dilemma. So uh, yes, you could screen her at that age and consider therapies if her bone density was low. But generally, we don't recommend it unless that she has a strong family history. My mom had a hip fracture. My sister has osteoporosis. Or she suffered from breast cancer and has been on chemotherapy and or early menopause. So I generally try to wait because I think it's not as actionable at that stage. And the data in that age group for fracture prevention is much less strong than it is in the older age group. Okay, great. I know we alluded to some of the screening tools, but if you just want to give our listeners a quick summary of what are the main screening tools we use for osteoporosis. So I think in the U.S., most of us use this FRAX tool, which gives you a, right at the bedside, uh, and it's a calculator that measures age, height, weight, and previous risk factors, particularly smoking, and also early menopause. So we generally use FRAX. I think age, previous fracture, and sex are the three most important criteria when we think about what we would consider therapeutic. And for screening, I think the, the most important thing to consider is, are these results going to be actionable? Or are we providing people with information that really just is in the gray zone and doesn't help us in terms of understanding long-term course or treatment options? Okay, got it. So Let's just move on with Mrs. Evans. Let's say she now gets a DEXA scan, so dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. I don't think I've ever said that word. <laughs> um, and it reveals that she has a bone mineral density with a T-score of negative 1.8 in the lumbar spine and then negative 
five in the total hip. So the range is suggestive of osteopenia. What do you do for these patients? What are the current recommendations for treatment of osteopenia? So she's 68 or 69, 68, yes. 68. Yeah. And so age is an independent risk factor for fracture. So immediately she has a greater risk of uh, future fracture. What's troublesome is not the bone density as much as the previous ankle fracture. And even though she may say, oh, I tripped and fell and had a trimalleolar fracture or a bimalleolar fracture, I think the evidence is very strong that in a postmenopausal woman with any type of limb or spine fracture, that their risk of fracture is much higher. So I'm inclined, even though the bone density is sort of quote unquote osteopenic, to treat her. And I think that is the approach that would probably provide the greatest prevention modality. Okay. And so if we have the same case and the same bone mineral density, but no ankle fracture. Would this be someone you said we can hold off on treatment? Oh, absolutely. So even though age is an independent fracture risk, if she's never fractured, her bone density is really only minimally reduced. And I would caution her that we may or may not know if there's going to be progressive bone loss, but at this stage, calcium and vitamin D and exercise sort of standard conservative therapies without uh, addressing a major intervention. And part of that is because we also know the extended lifespan of individuals. So using drugs before we're ready to use them really sort of exhausts our future use of these agents. And uh, the efficacy for a woman such as Ms. Evans, whose bone density is only slightly low, the evidence from the fracture intervention trial is that the fracture risk reduction is not statistically significant in a group of individuals such as her. Okay. So I would argue that just uh, I would just follow her. Okay, got it. With regards to uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation, how much calcium should she take? It'd be good to get a dietary history and assuming she gets about 500 milligrams in her diet, which is not hard to get from milk or yogurt or ice cream. I would recommend another 500 milligrams. I think we're getting much more conservative about calcium intake from supplements, in part because of the risk of renal stones in the Women's Health Initiative. There was a 17% increase in kidney stones in women who were prescribed 1,000 milligrams of calcium and had a calcium diet of about 1,000 milligrams. And I think most women now are consuming between 500 and 1,000. So I would recommend 500 milligrams. A single supplement is reasonable. In terms of vitamin D, For the most part, I generally argue that most people are sufficient, so a single dose of vitamin D, 400 units a day, is reasonable. The Institute of Medicine committee that I was on recommended 600 in Mrs. Evans' age group. I think that's very reasonable. I certainly don't think she needs large doses of vitamin D, and there's no evidence that that would help protect her from fractures. Okay. And then just in terms of Uh, vitamin D supplementation, D2 versus D3. When you say 400 international units, are you referring to D2 or D3? Yeah, I'm generally referring to D3, which is more commercially available. You can get D2. There's been always been a controversy about what's more effective. Both of them are 100% absorbable. And the question is, does D2 have a slightly different mode of action? And, And nobody's proven to my satisfaction that there's any difference. And so some vegetarians will want to use a D2 instead of D3. This is deviating a little bit from our topic for today, but vitamin D has been linked to a lot of different things from prevention of cancer to cardiovascular disease to diabetes. I would love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so nine years ago uh, in the Institute of Medicine Committee, we dealt with this issue and we had 36 diseases that there was indirect evidence or observational studies suggesting that vitamin D could have an impact. And at that time, we recommended that interventional studies be performed, randomized placebo-controlled trials. And the NIH took up that recommendation, and we now have several of them. The VITAL trial, which showed really no effect of vitamin D on cancer, at least initial cancer diagnosis, and uh, no effect on cardiovascular disease. Same thing with type 2 diabetes. There was a lot of observational data that vitamin D supplementation could impact the onset of type 2 diabetes, going from pre-diabetes to diabetes. And the D2D trial, and I was an author, really addressed that question by giving 4,000 units of vitamin D to pre-diabetic women and men and looking at their subsequent risk of uh, type 2 diabetes, overt type 2 diabetes. And we found there really was no statistically significant impact on the development of diabetes. 
So in general, and this has been reinforced by other trials in other countries, we just haven't seen much of an impact of vitamin D in the association with chronic diseases in randomized trials. Now, immunologically, there's some rationale for vitamin D having some effect on macrophage function. And ultimately, there may be a trial that shows some effect in either infectious disease or in immune function. But so far, we have yet to see that. Perfect. So let's go back to Mrs. Evans. And so you have her bone mineral density. You've looked at her risk factors and you say, okay, she needs treatment. What is the current recommended first line therapy for osteoporosis? So we just published the Endocrine Society guidelines, which came out in the journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism at the end of March. And at that time, we spent four years trying to develop consensus guidelines. It's not long at all. (laughs) (laughs) And among uh, five of us who were on the committee. And it's remarkable how much the art of medicine contributes to deciding what to do because people have different opinions. You have all this evidence, and it's very strong evidence, but there's always caveats. So bisphosphonates have been around for 25, almost 30 years now. Alendronate was the first one. It's generic. It's the cheapest one. And it's the one that showed significant fracture efficacy for both spine and hip fractures. And that was really the gold standard. In fact, the trial, the fracture intervention trial, had to be stopped after three years because ethically they could not continue due to the fact that the hip fracture reduction in the spine fracture reduction was so dramatic. 60 to 70 percent in spine, 20 to 30 percent in hip fracture. Subsequent bisphosphonates are currently available, ibendronate, residronate, which has the same hip fracture efficacy, and zoledronic acid or zoledronate. And uh, that's a once a year administration. So bisphosphonates work, but my preference is alendronate. And, and I, I think it's cheap, it's effective, and compliance is relatively good. Now, a lot of people don't adhere with long term uh, bisphosphonate therapy, and we have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But I think as initial, simple, once a week therapy, Alendronate still remains uh, the, and that's what we basically recommended in the Endocrine Society guidelines. Now, when you're starting patients on bisphosphonates, I think the thing that always comes up are these adverse effects, and I'm referring to osteonecrosis of the jaw and then atypical femoral fractures. There are usually huge barriers to actually initiating these medications. So I want to start off by talking about what the actual risk is of these uh, complications, and then I'd love to talk about how you actually counsel your patients. Yeah, so it's tough because they're both uh, unusual, and I would say osteonecrosis of the jaw is rare in the osteoporotic patient, in the primary osteoporotic patient. Now, we see osteonecrosis of the jaw with high-dose glucocorticoids and bisphosphonates and underlying disease such as diabetes or multiple myeloma, but in the osteoporotic woman such as Ms. Evans, The risk there is in the 1 to 100,000 range. It's really small. Even with dental surgery, the American Dental Society has lifted its sort of ban on bisphosphonate use prior to uh, dental surgery, and surveillance remains the most important uh, prevention method uh, in individuals who are on bisphosphonates and are undergoing any kind of dental procedures. So I think that's much less common. It's devastating when it occurs. It's a combination of, we think, infection, poor vascular supply, and then the bisphosphonates may be adding to that by impairing function of some of the immune cells. When we talk about atypical femoral fractures, that's what most women are worried about. And so the line that we get is, how can you give me this drug if it causes fractures? And this is, it seems counterintuitive, and it's a very common question. And people read all the time, and it's all over the TV uh, for legal and also on the internet. So, in general, we don't know the true uh, prevalence of atypical femoral fractures. It's clearly associated with bisphosphonates. I think we can say that now. It took us 10 years to say that. But these atypical femoral fractures, which occur in the upper region of the femur, and they're usually transverse and they're usually with minimal trauma, are clearly very devastating. And so we want to try to understand what some of the risk factors are. And um, there's some recent work from Dennis Black and his colleagues that have looked at large databases, uh, particularly Kaiser, that suggests that there are certain characteristics 
of individuals who are more likely to develop atypical femoral fractures. And that adds to your ability to talk to an individual patient about initiating bisphosphonate. So what are those characteristics? So generally, they're younger individuals rather than older, and they generally don't have as low a bone density as uh, most individuals who have osteoporosis. And then those of Asian descent tend to be at a significantly greater risk. So with those in mind, and careful surveillance and listening to the patient to understand if they have a thigh thigh pain or leg pain, which is a prodrome, I do initiate therapy, but with the caveats that, yes, atypical femoral fractures can occur. The risk is probably low, but it's in the 1 to probably 5,000 to 10,000 range, but it does occur. Duration of therapy is also important, and I'm sure you'll get to this drug holidays, but the idea that the longer you treat, the more likely your risk is probably established as well. So I think when I introduce the subject, I say, look, it's an unusual complication. I don't use the word rare because I think rare really denotes rare genetic diseases. This is not rare. I mean, we do see it. And I say it's an unusual complication. We'll do everything we can to profile you to understand what those risks are. So, and then I say, for the most part, the bisphosphonates are well tolerated. We're not planning to keep you on for a long time. So, for example, Mrs. Evans, so she, her bone density is not that bad. She's had one fracture. I would recommend three years of alendronate and then a timeout for a year or two and follow her bone density at the end. I don't know if I'd measure a bone density after I treated her because her, her values are not that bad. But let's take the uh, assumption that Mrs. Evans' bone density is minus three yeah. instead of minus 1.8. There, I think knowing the response to treatment is important because it does suggest uh, there's a strong parallel between the change in bone density and the fracture risk reduction. And there's some new data from the NIH that's, uh, again, Dennis Black and his colleagues that have suggested that there's a nice linear relationship between in large, large cohorts of drug trials combining all the drugs we use for osteoporosis between the change in bone density and the risk reduction. So if Mrs. Evans goes from minus 3 to minus 2.5, that's a very satisfactory response and would be one that would prompt me to not take her off it and to put her on a drug holiday for a year or two and give her an opportunity to let the dust settle for a while. So I think if, on the other hand, she had another fracture or her bone density did not improve, that'd make me think either, one, uh, she's not taking the drug, or two, it's not working, and we would think about alternatives. Okay. So just to clarify, in terms of once you've started someone on treatment, who would you consider repeating a, a bone mineral density scan and when? Like how yes. long would you give them? Is it one year, two years? So I always say two years, and they always say, I want it in three months, or I want it in yeah. six months, or I want it in a year. I want to see that I'm doing better. But I try to caution them that really there's such a sine wave of response. So the change in bone density can be different at six months and a year. And we generally like to have things settle out. So I would say two years is my earliest time for repeating the bone density, unless there's some extenuating circumstances or she's had another fracture and you're really wondering at whether uh, this is a progressive disease. And just to clarify that again, that's the only reason you want to wait that long is because really if you do a scan earlier, it's not going to be informative and it's not going to tell you anything because there's still changes happening and it takes up to two years. That's correct. And if you look at the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves and uh, fracture risk reduction, most of the action is occurring after one year. We're really not seeing a lot of early fracture risk reduction. Now, the anabolics may provide uh, a little different perspective on that, but with the bisphosphonates and other drugs, it really takes time for the skeleton to settle into this new therapeutic intervention. So I caution them that two years is probably reasonable. Two years is when Medicare reimburses. So that seems to be a logical point, and uh, particularly in individuals who have very low bone density. And Going back to the drug holiday, so I know you said you can do a drug holiday of between three to five years. And again, the whole reason we do this is to kind of 
mitigate these side effects, who's someone that you would not consider a drug holiday in? Right. So that's a great question. First of all, I want to uh, make it clear that the evidence about drug holidays is marginal, is that we really have very little randomized controlled trials that show that we have two, actually, that show that a drug holiday really may have an impact. It's certainly not enough to show that it reduces side effects, but the data from uh, the zoledronic acid extension a trial and the fracture intervention extension trial, FLEX, both show that you can safely take somebody off of bisphosphonate after three years for at least two years without increasing their fracture risk. Now, this is absolutely not the case for denosumab, which once you take them off, their fracture risk actually exceeds what their baseline fracture risk was, and bone loss begins to occur. But for the bisphosphonates, there's no question that that's the case. Now, who do we not take off? Generally, these are people with severe osteoporosis, and by that I mean multiple spine fractures, at least two spine fractures, and a bone density T-score of lower than minus 2.5. Those individuals particularly if they've been treated and their bone density is still well below minus 2.5. They are at very high risk, and those are the individuals we like to maintain on therapy. Okay, got it. So going back to our patient, Mrs. Evans, so she comes back to you two years later, and she now tells you that she was out walking in her front yard during the winter, she fell, slipped on the ice, and she had a colleague's fracture. Is this considered treatment failure because she tells you she's been taking the um, her alendronate religiously as prescribed? So let's start off with that first. Right. She's taking the alendronate. Radial fractures are a little different. They're still considered osteoporotic fractures, but the changes that occur in the radius are much less dramatic than they are in the other parts of the peripheral spine or in the other limb bones. I would consider it a failure. I think, again, Here she is. Her bone density is not that bad, but she's fracturing. So she has more impairment in her bone quality than in her bone quantity. And to me, that speaks, and we see this about a third of the time, we have individuals with not really, really low bone density, but they're fracturing. So their qualitative skeletal changes are more pronounced. And I would uh, consider changing her at this stage either to an intravenous bisphosphonate, such as soledronic acid, once a year, maybe consider denosumab, although I think the issue about what you do when you stop that is huge, or uh, an anabolic such as parathyroid hormone. And there, parathyroid hormone has been shown to reduce the risk of radial fractures, easily tolerated. We'd have to get the insurers to pay for it, but the fact that she had fractured again is a fairly strong signal that she has more severe disease than we're recognizing. Okay. So just to summarize, if you've been on treatment and you verify that they're taking it, if they have sustained a fracture while on treatment, that would be considered treatment failure. Yes, that's much more considered treatment failure than a dip in bone density. So let's say she comes back, she has not had a radial fracture, but her T-score is now minus 2 instead of minus 1.8. I don't consider that a failure. I consider that, again, just the response to the skeleton and that I would repeat it in two years and that she's still not in any danger, anything bad happening. We have no other signals that things are worse shape. Okay. And um, in terms of treatment, you mentioned switching from an oral bisphosphonate to an intravenous bisphosphonate. Could you argue that it's the same drug class, and if the one didn't work, then why do we think that the intravenous formulation is going to work better? Right. So that's a great point, and I think you could argue that. And again, this comes back to the art of osteoporosis right. medicine. But you could also argue that only 0.6% of alendronate gets absorbed. So if she has an absorption issue, mm-hmm. and she might at 69, that may be an intravenous bisphosphonate, which is more potent. So the other thing about zoledronic acid, when you look at potency in terms of its effect on bone resorption, is much stronger. So you could argue she's tolerating the bisphosphonate. Why not try another bisphosphonate? The other argument would say we'll go to an anabolic parathyroid hormone or uh, a valoparatide or even consider romososumab. But yeah, she's still young. She's 69. She's had a radial fracture and an ankle fracture, so she's had cortical fractures. These are not quite as ominous as having multiple spine fractures. So I'm not sure 
yet that uh, I move her into the severe osteoporosis category. Okay, got it. But I'm wavering. So recently, the FDA approved a new drug. This was developed after discovering a mutation in individuals who had high bone mass from a loss of function in a gene for sclerostin. Dr. Rosen, what is sclerostin? So sclerostin is a peptide produced by the osteocyte, which is the most common bone cell in the body. So the bone is made up of bone-forming cells, osteoblast bone-resorbing cells, osteoclasts, and osteocytes, which occupy 90% of the cell volume in the skeleton. And it's produced in response to a number of different signals. And its major role is actually interesting. It slows or stops the remodeling of the skeleton. And that's necessary. So we turn over 10% of our skeleton every year. But we've always wondered, what's stopping the turnover? You don't want to keep remodeling your skeleton at a fast rate because that makes the skeleton more fragile. So it's a 120-day cycle. It starts with bone resorption, and the osteoblasts come in and form new bone. But then what stops that? What stops the osteoblasts from forming new bone? And the answer is that it's sclerostin. So it's an inhibitor of uh, bone formation, and it works by acting on the LRP frizzle signaling pathway to uh, block further bone formation. And from this pathway and mechanism, we get romosuzumab, which is this monoclonal antibody that's directed against sclerostin. That's correct. And so the idea is that it inhibits sclerostin, and so it's going to enhance osteoblastic function. That's right. That's correct. So... In 2017, the journal published results from the ARCH trial, and this was a phase three multicenter international randomized double-blind study, which basically looked at postmenopausal women who had known osteoporosis in a previous fragility fracture. They were randomized to monthly romosuzumab or weekly oral alendronate for 12 months. And the primary endpoint here was the cumulative incidence of a new vertebral fracture at 24 months and a cumulative incidence of a clinical fracture that was either non-vertebral or a symptomatic vertebral fracture. Dr. Rosen, what were the main findings from this study? Well, I think one of the most important things about this study trial was that it was a comparative effectiveness trial. So you have a drug and you generally, in osteoporosis, we tested them against placebo. Here, you're testing it against an established anti-fracture drug, alendronate. And so the impact of romososumab was dramatic in that it reduced fractures much more than alendronate alone. So that's one thing. The second thing was that uh, the effect was really during the first year and in the second year of the trial, everybody got alendronate. So you had alendronate, alendronate versus romososumab and alendronate. And it appeared that the alendronate in the second year in the romososumab trial was synergistic to what had been the exposure to romososumab. So what you had was a formula for using this drug in clinical practice. So the FDA approved this for one year, and so the question became, what happens after one year? And here, you see that by adding a bisphosphonate or an antiresorptive such as denosumab, you get continued or even greater fracture risk reduction. The bone density changes are dramatic. Mm -hmm. So romososumab increases bone mass by 16% or so in the spine, numbers that we never conceived were possible. But what's interesting, uh, it does plateau over time. So even though you're still giving the antibody, it isn't quite a linear relationship. So it goes up really fast in terms of bone density, and then it sort of plateaus. So one year was a reasonable way to really build bone, and uh, it's met with huge expectations. Everybody in the field has waited for something like this. The question will be is how different really is it beyond a one-year uh, treatment regimen, and what do we do afterwards? And that's where this trial turned out to be important. Okay. What about the rates of osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femoral fractures? I know we talked about it for bisphosphonates right, and for right. denosumab. What about here with this medication? So the surprise in the antiscleroscin antibody is something that goes back to the biology of sclerostin, and that is that sclerostin not only blocks bone formation, but it also stimulates new bone resorption. So it's actually causing a decrease in bone when you have uh, too much sclerosin. So blocking it not only increases bone mass by stimulating new bone, but it also blocks bone resorption. So by working through rankle, 
So what you have is a, an ideal drug. Probably why the impact is so great on bone density is you're stimulating bone formation and you're suppressing bone resorption. So in some ways, it's like an anti-resorptive and an anabolic. It does both. And it yeah. does both. And that's why the risk of ONJ and uh, atypical fractures is still there because it's doing something on the resorption side. And that seems to be why the bisphosphonates are associated with it. And of course, denosumab is also associated with atypical femoral fractures. So if you stop bone resorption, you do increase your risk of having an atypical femoral fracture. Got it. Okay. The ARCH trial that we talked about also um, found an increase in serious cardiovascular events in the romosuzumab group uh, compared to the alendronate group. What do we make of that? Well, I was on the FDA panel, so that was the most important question for yeah. us. And the answer is the risk of cardiovascular disease in this cohort that was studied is small. So the absolute risk in the 1.5 to 2.3 range for percent of major cardiovascular events. But there was this statistically significant greater event rate in cardiovascular events in the Romo treated group. And this is the second trial. The FRAME trial also showed the same thing. So it made us wonder about what's going on. Why would there be cardiovascular events? And uh, most commonly, we see, and we see it at New England Journal all the time, that new drugs have off-target effects. So you could say, well, it has an off-target effect, but we don't understand the mechanism. But it turns out that sclerostin is produced not just in the bone, but also in the aorta and the blood vessels. And so, yeah. And that was a surprise to us because in the scleriostosis patients, there was no risk of cardiovascular disease. They didn't die prematurely of cardiovascular disease. And in the mouse models where we deleted sclerostin, there was no evidence of cardiovascular risk. So I think it's an ongoing issue. The FDA decided that they would put a flag on the indication and say that individuals at high risk of cardiovascular events probably should not be treated with romososumab. And we have to wait and see. Okay. And I know you mentioned that the FDA recently approved this medication. Is this something that's going to change how you practice in terms of prescribing it? I think on the primary care level, probably not. It's an injection once a month. But I think for those primary care physicians who see severely affected individuals who have either not complied or adhere with previous treatment or failed previous treatment, this is a very reasonable option, and the FDA approved it for severe osteoporosis. So will it change practice? I think it will provide us with another option, another anabolic approach, a parathyroid hormone or abaloparatide, PTH-related peptide analog, or romosostomab. Give us three options in individuals with severe osteoporosis. Okay, so we've covered a lot today. Let's just go through some main takeaways. Osteoporosis is common but remains underdiagnosed and undertreated. Screening should be considered in postmenopausal women over the age of 65, men over the age of 70, and those with risk factors, including fracture before the age of 50, and also with the use of certain medications, which include chronic steroids. First-line therapy for treatment remains bisphosphonates. Once you start treatment, you want to consider repeating a DEXA scan after two years. Other agents to consider for treatment besides bisphosphonates include denosumab and teriparatide. Romosuzumab is a monoclonal antibody directed against chlorostin. In the recently published ARCH trial, romosuzumab, when compared against alendronate, have reduced the incidence of new vertebral fractures of 24 months and the incidence of a clinical fracture. It was associated with serious cardiovascular events and should be avoided in those with known history of cardiovascular events. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rosen, for joining us on this episode. I hope we've given our listeners a bit more insight into both aspects of clinical practice and a point of access to the primary literature that makes up the New England Journal of Medicine. Please visit our newly updated endocrinology guide for more information on osteoporosis at resident360.nejam.org. I want to thank our expert today, Dr. Rosen, our production team here at NEJAM Resident 360, which includes Karen Buckley, Kyle Simmons, Mike Tomasis, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Special thanks also to Dr. Angela Castellanos and Dr. Angela Chen, my co-editorial fellows, and our education editor, Dr. O.P. Hammondvik. I'm Amanda Fernandez, editorial fellow at the NEJAM. Please join us again for our next episode.